Phil, I can hear you in the distance. I'm there. <laughs> I'm with you. I knew you were because, like, like my kids when they were young, when they were being quiet for too long, I knew they were getting into trouble. So I heard you being quiet over there. I'm not getting into trouble. I'm being, I am being a good boy. Yeah. No trouble for me. Phil, Phil calls each morning at uh, 6.35, and uh, he does the two-minute, airs about 6.38 and 7.38, a two-minute preview of the business day. But, Phil, you've got a new workout partner on your way to the gym every morning when you call me. I do for the summer, and I'm trying to get her to speak up because if you recall <laughs> when she was in, I guess, eighth grade, she spent a good hour on your show one day talking about the Hatfields and McCoy. She did. She did and a great job, too. So I told her, I was like, you're going to have to, we're going to have to give you a cute little name, uh, like financial fill and, and get you on one morning, get you to say something. And she's just shaking her head no. So that was. <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll, we'll just everything. call her not not Gabby Abby. How's that? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, she is Gabby though for sure. But uh, yeah, she's home for the summer, so I got I got a new gym partner in the morning. I've been dragging her out of bed. That's awesome, to, man. Uh, to, to go with me. Very nice. Hey, uh, let's see. You know, Friday, I look at my phone and I I check out. What's going on on Wall Street? And out of nowhere, it's just exploding. So I, I look and I, I discover it's all about this jobs report. And I ask myself, wait a second. Are we in good news is good news mode or good news is bad news mode? And then the reverse of that, bad news is good news or is bad news, bad news, Phil. Because during the course of this uh, pandemic and the slump that followed the aftermath of it, I haven't been able to be clear on what good news is or what bad news is. Yeah, and, and in this case, and it has been for the last year or so, when we got positive economic data that, was in, that would be inflationary pressure, such as a really good job support. Now, there were some things in there that would say, hey, this, we're kind of leveling out on the wage base or for wages. So that, that was... That was, that was positive from inflation, from the inflation standpoint. But we got a good jobs report. It was, it was much better than expected, and our markets reacted as such, like it would in normal, in normal times where we weren't battling inflation. And to me, that was confusing because, like you, I saw the numbers, and my first thought was that jobs report must have been terrible. That was the first thing that came to my mind, and I couldn't have been more wrong and it was a good jobs report. So what that tells us is that we have now baked in that the Federal Reserve is going to pause. And we had said before that, you know, their increases or what they do is has been minimalized because it's not as they're not swinging that bad as hard, right? So it's only a quarter of a percent instead of three quarters of a percent. We all knew that. And now we're looking forward to what they may do in the future, whether they're going to pause or and, or pivot, they kind of cut that out. So hey, look, don't don't be expecting a pivot here anytime soon. So now that puts more pressure on this CPI report that we get. Could it be? You know, if we keep a good jobs report and we can battle inflation and get inflation back down to our target, all at the same time. And I'm sure this is going to be a bumpy road. But if it happens all at the same time, that tells us that maybe there's a chance for this soft landing. Now some people think that's still possible. Some people don't. A soft landing mean that we bring inflation back down without going into a recession, and one of those recession measures is employment. So if our employment numbers still look really good and we still have really low unemployment rate, while inflation is coming down, does that mean that maybe we can have a soft landing? And that was the reaction that we got on Friday, thus putting more pressure on that CPI report that we get on Wednesday. Now that we had the good – the good jobs number uh, last week, if this CPI report is 5.5 or below, and of course they're going to, you can dig into it and see exactly how we get to that CPI number, but if it's 5.5 or below, that would suggest that, yep, that good jobs report didn't hurt us on the inflation front, and maybe we can hang on to what we got on Friday, what we made on Friday. Now, we have to put Friday into perspective as well. It was still a negative week overall but i'm not going to lick it, look at get horse in the mouth is it look or lick i've never been able to figure that out we got in a debate about that the other day and my wife has it look or is it lick a gift horse in the mouth it's, i'm not it's quite look. sure it's look uh, nobody look, would lick okay, it lick a it. horse in the I'm mouth Phil. Lick a horse. yeah i was getting ready to say i'm never going to lick a horse in the mouth and tell you about it how, how country are you <laughs> phil <laughs> I'm, I'm very country 
That Marshawn you know, guy from the Bruins. Right? We were just talking about the Hatfields and McCoys. Yeah. But yeah. the uh, And you never know with those guys. Maybe they are licking horses. No, but, no one's <laughs> licking horses in the mouth, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody. Hey, by the way, I've always wanted to be an intro. That does not need to be an intro. Like <laughs> too, too, too late, late buddy. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 sir. You're no. starring tomorrow no, morning. So, but nonetheless, last week was still a rough week even though we had that really good Friday. But it does put more pressure on Wednesday. If our inflation numbers are 5.5 or below, we're going to start to look and say, hey, maybe this can happen. Maybe there's a chance that we can have this soft landing. Or even if we do go into a recession, it's not as long or as deep as what we had feared. So that was what Friday was all about, plus Apple, of course. Apple had, a, had pretty good earnings, so that, that gave us a boost as well. Janet Yellen is warning this morning that uh – there's going to be a day in early June when we cannot pay our debt obligations. The market at this point doesn't seem to be worried about that, but I imagine as we get closer, it's going to have to start paying more attention. I think as we get really close, because this seems to be an annual story, it doesn't really, you know, the, uh, I think our, our Mr. Market, as one of, of, of my professors used to call it, uh, Mr. Market it kind of assumes that they'll argue back and forth and blame each other for this, that, and the other but at the end of the day, as the clock, struck, the clock strikes midnight, they will find a solution and raise that debt limit yet again. And I think our markets assume that. So the closer we get, it may have some impact. But up until then, we're, we'll pay more attention to economic data, what the Federal Reserve is going to do. And I welcome this, but what companies are actually making, you know, what, how are companies actually doing? Because ultimately, that's all that really matters in the long run anyway is how companies really doing, and we try to perceive and project out what they may do in the current economic environment and react off that. But at the end of the day, it does come back to company earnings. But for the time being, no, I don't think our markets are paying attention to it at all. Yeah, uh, Phil, the market, um, we've always been told the markets like clarity. Uh, hope for clarity. Uh, I listened to Janet Yellen yesterday, and I got anything except clarity from what she said. <laughs> it was very confusing. There was no clear direction of where she thought we'd be going. Uh, will this any way impact the market on the short term? I realize uh, everything's going to be on somewhat of a hold until we get much closer to debt sale and see how Congress reacts. But will uh, Secretary of Treasury Yellen's Yellen's comment have anything to do for the market? No, not in the short term. And, and as as we as we're far out from it, or I guess a month or so away from it, uh, we'll kind of ignore that. But as we lead up to it, we get maybe a few days closer. Then we, we may start to get a little bit nervous because of the jawboning or the talk from from our politicians will, will lead us to believe, and this is how our markets see this, will lead us to believe that, oh, my gosh, they're not going to come to a resolution. And then and it happens every year. It's in, in my own mind, I think, oh, my gosh, they're never going to agree on this. What's going to, what's going to come of, of the stock market the following day? Because remember, my focus, my window is on the stock market and how our investments look. But at the end of the day, they do. They come to an agreement and they, they knock it out at 12, as, at 12 o'clock at night or whatever it may be. And leading up to it, they all blame each other. They blame the other side. It's your fault. No, it's, 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 it's not our fault. It's your fault. And then when they come to a resolution, it's like, well, we, 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 uh, we, made the, we reached across the aisle and we made an agreement. And, and it does get kind of old. Their markets are, aren't paying attention to it right now. And unless something major would come out or McCarthy or someone like that would be like, nope, we're not we're not coming to an agreement. We're not raising this debt limit. We are not. And that may have like an impact. But this far out, we just tend to our, our markets just tend to blow blow that off. It, it really does, because it's, it's an annual thing. If we do not come to a debt ceiling agreement, is it going to be as disastrous as what some folks say it will be? Well I, well, I don't know, because then we start to talk about the longevity of it, right? So if we have, if they don't come to an agreement, and then on June 5th, they do come to an agreement, we'll likely make back what we lost. So it really doesn't, you know, as far as our markets are concerned, it really doesn't play that large of a role, unless it were, if it was long standing and they didn't, say, for the rest of the year or for a few months, and then that would have a, more, a, a bigger impact. But, again, it, it tends to be our, our markets just kind of roll our eyes at, at those politicians when it comes to the debt, debt ceiling. Hey, 
Hey, Phil. It occurs to me, I, I, I haven't taken an econ class in, in, in quite some time. But as, as we see, the Fed continues to raise their rates, but at a, at a slower pace, I guess. Uh, mortgage rates are still higher than we're used to them being, yet the housing market continues to be strong. The job market continues to be strong. Uh, this, this kind of flies in, in the, the face of tradition, right? So is there an advantage to a new normal where the, instead of a 2% interest rate being the, the norm that a 5% interest rate is, excuse me, inflation rate, not interest rate, that a 5% inflation rate is, is there an advantage in that over a lower one? No, I don't, I don't think, you know, not a 5%. If we said, hey, we'll, we'll live with a 3% or 4%, uh, maybe from that standpoint, we have to remember someone brought this up the other day. And, you know, we, there, there are advantages to having higher rates. And that advantage is, is you're more prepared to deal with something like COVID. You know, think back to 2018. I think it was 2018 when we increased rates. They continued to increase rates a quarter per quarter. And that didn't seem to hurt our markets too bad. I remember saying that all the time, a quarter per quarter. Somebody had made fun of me about it because I always said it. But if we hadn't done that, if they hadn't done that in 2018, what would we have done to keep our economy uh, in line or boost our economy throughout COVID? Because the number one tool that we used, you know, it didn't gain the most headlines, but it was cutting rates down to zero or whatever it was in April of 2020. That was our number one tool to boost our economy. So in the face of tragedy, one of the tools that our Federal Reserve has is cutting rates. And if rates are high, well, that's just more room they have to cut. And that takes us back to you know, all the debates, like they're going too far, they're going too far. And a lot of people have said that, and they think that the Federal Reserve is going too far in this battle with inflation. And, and, you know, and, I, and I can back that back by saying, well, look, it's really easy to cut those rates. It's harder to increase them and in slow inflation than it is to cut the rates and encourage spending. So from that standpoint, they'd rather go too far than not far enough. But in terms of inflation, inf in, in, inflation is healthy, right? A certain amount of inflation is healthy. But at 5%, it, it does tend to be, you know, if it's, if it's prolonged at 5%, for, as, as, for your example, that's just too much. You know, everything goes up way too much. You get, every time you go to do something, it gets more and more expensive. It is just too fast. So that's why they have that target of two. It used to be 3%, I think, back in the early Trump days. It was like, oh, we want our target to be 3%. And they couldn't get there. But So now the target's 2%. I do wonder if they change the target. Our target inflation rate right now, they're saying, hey, it's 2%. I do wonder if they're going to say, well, let's, let's live with 3%. Because if we get to 3%, and this is just an example, if we get to 3% inflation or close to it, and we still have a healthy jobs market, and people are still somewhat spending money. Now, demand has been curbed strongly, and we see that on a lot of areas. So they have slowed consumer demand. It still remains resilient, but it has slowed uh, consumer demand. And if we get down to 3% and we still have jobs, well, why wouldn't they? You know, why wouldn't they then be more accommodative and stop uh, the increase or even consider pivoting at some point? And from I, I would agree that maybe 3% could be a new target Five percent, maybe a little much. So, Phil, we've we've seen a lot of swings in the market, uh, and I think this is kind of to be expected. Uh, but we've also seen a lot of pressure points in the last several months or several years: the bank failures, the debt ceilings, inflation, and the like. Uh, is the uh, uh, is the market more conscious of or more responsive to these various pressure points than say it was fifteen, twenty years or so ago? I think so because of how easy, and it's, it goes back to the old technology debate, how quickly we get information, we receive information, and how quickly people can trade off that information. And I'm not talking about financial planners like, like us where we tend to never trade off. You know, we have a, an asset allocation, and we rely on that asset allocation to get us through the tough times. That's proven to work, by the way, even in these volatile times that has proven to be the best solution, but on an individual basis, remember, you know, we got a lot of money in 401ks, and as we become more in tune to technology and more comfortable with technology, 
people can get on their phones at a stoplight or in a parking lot. They hear a headline on CNBC or MSNBC or whatever it may be. They hear one person speak, and it changes their tune on how they should be, be invested. And there are studies showing how the wild swings also with, four, with self-managed 401Ks where someone's going 100% equities and then zero equities and 100% equities and just back and forth based off what they feel. or may, It could even be the time that they're listening. And it sounds silly, but it's accurate. Based off the time that they're driving to work, well, this radio station normally has this person on and this person's always bearish or this per- person's always bullish because they always give two sides to the story. If you listen long enough, it's just which one you hear. But if you listen to the, the, the entire program, for the most part, those big syndicates, they, they give both sides. They give, the, okay, this person thinks the markets are going up, and this is why. This person thinks the markets are going down, and this is why. This person thinks bonds is great, and this is why. And this person thinks bonds are terrible, and this is why. It could be dependent upon when someone's listening to uh, on their way to work or they're doing their chores or whatever it may be. And they're trading hundreds and thousands of dollars in their portfolio based off of that. So, yes, it is much more volatile and sensitive than what it used to be because of technology and the the ability for people individuals to trade that quickly their own accounts let me add to that very quickly artificial intelligence something we're hearing a great deal about and there's a lot of nervousness of how it could affect our society as a whole is the market taking any precaution uh, to avoid a false statement that with with the volatility we're seeing uh, not that I'm aware of at the moment where our markets are looking into AI is what companies are digging into it the most and which ones can profit from it the most. And But overall, that would be the SEC that would be paying close attention to that. Hey, who's putting out false a false narrative or a president saying something or a market mover like Elon Musk or, 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 or someone of, of that nature, Mark Cuban even, saying something that publicly that would make our markets go one way or the other. But if they are, I'm not aware of it. We're on, on the ground, we are becoming more aware of it. The, the fear that we have is the ability to mimic someone's voice. Because if you think even you know now when people call and they need money or they oftentimes, especially a small business, you'll recognize your, your client's voice or you'll re- recognize a customer's voice, and that's how you're identifying, yep, that's who this is. This is. But with the ability to mimic people's voices so easy, that's what scares me. And this is a very small, you know, this is a, a, a minute example, but that's what scares me when our clients call in and ask for a withdrawal or, or ask for their balance or ask for an account number or something of that, that, that nature. We pay attention. We, we know our clients and we know their voices. And in the areas where we don't, you know, maybe we have a few clients that we can't get a hold of or haven't spoken to. We always verify who they are. But, you know, the, the voice being the number one way that we do that, we're going to have to take other measures here shortly or eventually to, you know, whether it's a, an identifying question or some sort of question about the last time that they were in. And then that makes it makes life difficult on the street. And it's not just us. You, know, you think of just, you know, your local bank or you think of a, a propane company that may have your bank account on file or, or, or a credit card company or I guess credit card company wouldn't recognize your voice. But that's what kind of concerns me is that, that the ability to mimic voices like that. That does worry me. I had uh, someone, I used my voice and I called Stubblefield and said, Rob's been kidnapped and need you to sell some Tesla stock and put it in Rob's account or else he's off. <laughs> and I said, tough. <laughs> <laughs> he, I, I saw. He, 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 he said, "Gilstrap, get in there tomorrow. We need you." <laughs> yeah. If you're going to, if you're going to dispatch Rob, be gentle. <laughs> <laughs> but dispatch him, you may. Uh, Phil, uh, you know this last credit, uh, this last uh, rate increase by Powell. You know, I've, I've been critical of him for continuing to raise rates, and I always share that opinion with you, which I'm sure you just love in the middle of the day. But. I have seen more people agreeing with me now on this latest one than previously. A lot of people are down on that guy for this latest quarter point hike. Well, and I, it's almost the proof will be in the pudding. Because you know, at the end of the day, what is the end result? And we don't know that. You know, we have to remember every rate increase takes about three to six months to work its way through our economy. So was this last one too much? Well, it was only a quarter of a percent. 
And, you know, from the standpoint of safety and being conservative, and it sounds crazy with, with you know, as aggressive as they have been, but it's easier to undo that. It's easier to undo the uh, a mistake if you if you went too far than to fix it if you didn't go far enough. And let's think, that's what got us here, right? They didn't go far enough. They waited too long. Things like the Delta variant and Omicron and Russia all pushed them off. They wanted to begin this, you know, a few years back when, the, or was that 2021 in May of 2021 with Delta, and that they were going to begin it then, and they couldn't. And you know, and I've I've, I've defended them almost relentlessly, defending them, but because of well, how could we? Because we don't know what this is going to do. Are we going to have to send people home again? We were still in the midst of wearing a mask everywhere we went. How can we increase rates when we had, we're, you know, we have a stronger economy at the moment? But if we increase rates and we have to send people home, then that's going to be terrible. So they didn't. So they had to increase too much. They had to go those three quarters of a percent because they waited. And that has been difficult on everyone. But cutting rates, man, it's easy. You know, everybody loves you when you do it. And everybody's market, the markets go up and rates become cheaper. They love you when you do that. The hard part is getting inflation in line. So from that standpoint, the proof will be in the pudding. It's just going to take a little while before we figure it out. Yeah, I I think uh, we'll see the after effects of the commercial real estate market from this aren't going to be pretty, my opinion. No, and that's going to be in combination with COVID as well, because COVID, you know, this, this new norm that we have where it's more acceptable to work at home, that's going to hurt the commercial real estate as well. Phil, how do we reach you for more information today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and sit with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. Have a great day.